Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Wiggle Wednesday. Today, we're going to be talking about harvesting, uh, especially an urban worm bag, but other worm bins as well. And then we'll touch on screening and trommeling your worm castings if you want to get those sifted down to a finer size. Uh, do you have any announcements, Steve? Uh, none that I came prepared with, to be honest with you. Um, so just to give everybody a, a, a heads up um, on what we're going to do here is uh, this is we're going to try something a little bit new today. So Troy is going to give a normal kind of five to 10 minute presentation off of PowerPoint. And then um, and then I'm going to actually go out to behind my barn. Hopefully the, all the technology works OK. And we're going to show you some some video of a quick, very quick, like urban worm bag um, uh, tour, and then a, a, just a harvest of what it looks like, or at least what it should look like coming out of the bottom of the bag. Uh, I will tell you that that my bag is probably a little bit wetter on the bottom than I prescribe for other people because I'm a little more careless. Um, so I'm going to show you some what the material looks like, though, that I'm getting out of the bottom of the bag. Then we're going to do some uh, live demos of uh, of some harvesting equipment. So we're gonna start from small and then go to big. So we're gonna start with a small hand sifter. We're gonna to go to um, a Brockwood worm shifter, which is a kind of a interesting, I sort of like, sort of don't like a uh, piece of equipment that's a, basically a flat like shaker table to shake the, the castings loose. And then we'll show you the big daddy, the trommel. And that's going to be that's going to be fun. Now, the one thing I want to say is, with the exception of the live vermicompost that I'm pulling out of the bottom of the urban worm bag, which isn't going to be much, we're going to be using what are like the pre-compost. Well, I'd say pre-composted or kind of broken down wood chips. So I've had a pile back there for close to a year now that's been that's been uh, breaking down. So we're gonna we're gonna look at that, um, uh, use that as our material for screening. But I think you're going to get a lot out of this. Um, I will tell you that when you're watching this stuff with the PowerPoint, it's a little bit dry at first, but that's why we want to add some of this uh, texture later with the um, with the material that we're or with the the equipment that we'll be showing you out back. So at some point, I'll be checking out, walking back to the uh, walking back to the uh, to the behind the barn, and then we'll we'll get going, and that'll be after Troy's after Troy's presentation. So back to you, buddy. Cool. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, this should be uh, just a quick coverage of harvesting a worm bag. I'm sure many people here have harvested worm castings from whatever bins that they've had, but hopefully we'll give you some extra tips and guidance on ways to get better at that or do it more efficiently. So let me get started with my PowerPoint presentation here. One second, I got to bring it up. Okay. I'll, I'll go ahead and get rid of the uh, the bottom banner there. Um, cool, thanks. There we are, yep. So yeah, today we're gonna be talking about harvesting worm castings or vermicompost. Um, how do you get that black gold after you've gone through all the work of keeping and feeding worms for a while and uh, done all this, how do you get your worm castings out and Put them to use. So first we'll talk about what are worm castings and vermicompost and give a couple definitions and then we're going to go through how to harvest an urban worm bag since a lot of people own urban worm bags since we're the urban worm company and then we'll go to through how to harvest other styles of bins uh, mainly like the box style bin where you're not having a flow through system and then we'll talk about methods for separating worms from the material when you're trying to get worm composting separated from worms and then we'll go through like steve said he's gonna uh take you back in his uh worm composting area and show you the urban worm bag uh, a couple of different sifters or the uh, sifter and then the brockwood uh shaker and a trommel and then we'll go through some q a so uh what are worm castings and vermicompost so uh, there's different terms. Uh, in Rhonda Sherman's new book, she uses the word vermicast to kind of sorry to kind of marry the two terms of uh, vermicompost and worm castings. So worm castings are strictly worm poop. It's when you have material that's been completely worked through by worms, and you've got nice crumbly soil-looking material that's uniform in size. Um, 
that's going to be full of beneficial biology, even more so than vermicompost or co regular compost, because all of it has been passed through the worms and worms inoculate. Uh, their poop gets inoculated with even more biology and bacteria that's inside their guts. So worm castings are going to be uh, all material that's been worked through by worms. That's going to be different from vermicompost or vermicast in that those are going to be uh, when you're screening, like, so when you're running through something through a screen, if you screen material, the worm castings are going to come out at the smaller screen size and vermicompost are going to have more organic matter mixed in. Uh, it's going to have worm castings along with things that have been composted by bacteria and fungi and eaten by other micro microorganisms. So vermicompost is going to be a mix of worm castings and composted material and worm castings are strictly worm poop. I just wanted to get that point across. If I can add, if I can add a little bit there, Troy, is that, you know, there's, there's a difference. Uh, there's a point at which vermicompost sort of becomes worm castings, but Correct. it's a spectrum because worm castings, there's no such thing as a hundred percent pure worm castings. If somebody tells you that, then they probably don't know what they're talking about. Um, there is basically things that are mostly worm castings with less of the coarse material, less worms, less, but it's, it's a, it's a spectrum, but you're never a hundred percent pure on the worm castings. So yes, that's, thank that's you for my, clarifying my point that. there. Yep. So how do you harvest an urban worm bag? Uh, it's good to prepare ahead of time. If you know that you're wanting to harvest or you know that you have some castings or vermicompost that's on the bottom section, it, you've built a good amount up in your bin and you know that it's ready to be harvested soon. It's good to kind of prepare the bin so that you uh, don't have to deal with as many worms in the bottom and you're ready to go as far as pulling uh, straight worm uh, vermicompost out the bottom or worm casting. So it's good to manage the moisture so that the bottom doesn't produce leachate uh, the whole time that you're managing the worm bin. It's good to uh, just, if you're adding any uh, water to it, just mist the top, but most of the liquid's going to be coming from the food scraps that you're providing. So if, when you're uh, <clears throat> adding food, we stress this basically with everything that we talk about is that you want to make sure you're adding bedding every time that you're adding nitrogenous material like food scraps or uh, whatever that you have, that has more nitrogen, you wanna also make sure that you're adding bedding in there to soak up some of that moisture and you're not getting extra leachate. The more water that you have moving down to the bottom of your bin, the more worms really like moisture, they need moisture and that moisture is gonna provide uh, an environment that has more microorganisms and that's what worms munch on. So they're gonna like a wet area. So that's what you, why you wanna try and keep the bottom of the bin where it's not getting a bunch of moisture leaking through. So managing the moisture is number one. And then another thing you can do to prepare ahead of time is to add uh, food that worms especially like, which would be like a melon, like watermelon or cantaloupe or pumpkin if it's fall time or autumn uh, or a commercial worm chow if that's something you use. So those foods are going to attract the worms to the upper section of the bin, which common sense, if they're attracted to the upper section, then there's not going to be as many in the lower section where you're trying to harvest your vermicompost. Uh, and then after a few days, you're going to have most of the worms be up near that food and you can harvest at the bottom without having to separate out a ton of worms. Uh, and then yeah. we've got the note there that a wet bottom will stay wet. That's what I had mentioned just a couple minutes ago is that you're going to want to try and not be adding a bunch of moisture to the top where you're having it leach through to the bottom because the more moisture you have in the bottom, the more worms you're going to have congregate in that section. So you'll be having to separate out more worms, but we'll be getting to that in a few minutes on how you do that when you get to that point. One, uh, one thing to add here, Troy is, is, uh, and for everyone else, if you either if you don't have an urban worm bag or haven't read the instructions or you do have an urban worm bag and have not read the instructions, uh, the the bag should be harvested after about four to six months. Um, the, that's when the first harvest should happen. And the bag is about 75 percent full. You don't want to be harvesting a bag that's like a quarter to a half, uh, like a half full, 50 percent full. You risk all of the stuff coming out of the bottom all at once. You need that time, you need that volume, because what happens is the sort of the conical shape of the of the bag 
produces compaction both down and sideways. And so you can actually open up the bag and the entire contents aren't going to come through. There's something called bridging, which allows that, that vermicompost to stay up in the bag. And you'll see that today because I'll open up the bottom and the entire stuff is not going to come out. So um, that is that is one thing, too. And I just want to stress the, the whole point about if you if and it's really tough to do early on is that um, you're going to mismanage the moisture, the less uh, volume you have in the bag. So it's often that you'll have a wet bottom, a uh, drier, drier middle, and then a more moist top. And so what you can do is if you do get that wet, moist, wet harvest out of the bottom, which is likely still to have a lot of worms in it, you can just take that material, put it back in the top for another, for another trip through, because it's going to have a lot of worms in it, which sort of defeats the purpose of the urban worm bag in the first place. So uh, all right, back to you, Troy. Yeah, thanks for adding that because I did mean to mention that you want your bin to be mainly full before you're ready to harvest. Uh, another thing, <clears throat> I don't know if I have it on the next slide, but it's good. So if you're someone who's feeding every three days or once a week, it's good to stop feeding. And I believe I mentioned this on the next slide, but uh, in case I'll cover it now, but it's good to stop feeding so that you're letting the worms uh, really process all that material for sure. And, you know, once you've got, once they've worked through material, they'll even chew through their own poo in the future. Uh, if, if there's not food there, so it's good to lay, leave them go for, you know, at least a couple of weeks without adding food so that you're getting plenty more, um, material worked through that you can then harvest. So you want to <clears throat> open up the bottom of the bin which steve will go through in a few minutes here when he goes shows you live uh it's good to start off by before you even opening it necessarily you can uh, pop the or thump the side of the bag there at the bottom and kind of massage around you know grabbing the bag and massaging it like this so that you're loosening up and you don't have one big massive wad of vermicompost down there um Again, watching your moisture levels. If you reach up there and grab a handful and squeeze it, if you've got one drop of water coming out or water between your fingers, then you're around 50% moisture and you should be good. Um, if you have castings that are too wet, it's good to let them, uh, if you're going to screen that material, it's good to let them sit out for a day or so. Um, you know, just lay them out uh, on a cover or a drop cloth or you know, if you dump it into a wagon or a wheelbarrow, just kind of flatten it out and, and let it dry before you're going to screen it to get some of that moisture to lift out of there. Uh, if you need, if you've got way too much moisture and you need to suck up some of that moisture, you can add some dry cocoa core because uh, it's going to be small and particle size and it'll suck up moisture, but then also be able to uh, be added easily to your vermicompost and then screened if you need to screen it. And then if you've got any large chunks that are coming out the bottom or wood chips or something like that, that you don't necessarily want in your fine vermicompost, then you can just toss those big chunks back into the top of the worm bag and or worm bin, whatever you're using. And then they can be uh, worked again by microorganisms and worms. Oop. Hit the wrong button. So if you're using another type of bin, like a box, uh, some people use just, you know, like a large Rubbermaid bin that's a foot and a half by two feet or whatever, and you're filling up the bin fully before you're harvesting it. Um, and then you're basically dumping out all the material from there and separating worms from the worm castings or vermicompost. One of the ways that you can uh, separate them is using a light method, which we'll detail in the next slide. You can also use a mesh box or bag with foods to attract the worms. So um, if you're the whole efficiency wise, when you're trying to harvest wor worm vermicompost or worm castings, the whole issue is trying to get your worms out of that material. That's the biggest issue. So that's why uh, flow through bins work well. Uh, and that's why a lot of people use screens or trommels. But um, I don't know if they make them anymore. They used to use put strawberries in those little uh, like net boxes or mesh boxes that are green and plastic. You could take something like that and put some cocoa core in there and add melon or uh, some type of sweet fruit in there to attract worms. Put that in the bury that in the top of your worm bin or 
like those uh, onion bags or garlic bags that you get at the grocery store. You could use those. Those are mesh and put some cocoa core and some melon or something in there. Bury it just in the top or leave it sit on the top and bury it a little bit. And then the worms are going to be attracted up there, go into the mesh part, and then you can easily pull that out. And you've got a bunch of worms that are already taken out of your material that you have less to separate through in the future there. Uh, yeah, the yeah. onion, the onion, the onion bag one I've done done really well. That's really more of a, the the thing that you're never going to do with those things is actually remove all the worms from everything else. Like some are just going to stay stubbornly where they are. They're perfectly happy in the in the wet, richer material. Um, but that you can you can basically extract a whole lot of those worms out of there at one time, and then use that stuff to start a new bin. Uh, and I would probably also, if you're starting a new bin, use a lot of that existing vermicompost to put in the the new bin along with that kind of onion bag full of worms that you got. Uh, so I, I like that onion, that onion bag method. You basically kind of, just like Troy said, put some material in there, put some fresh from uh, some, you know, you can put some coconut core in there, but push, put that fresh food in there, kind of bury it for a bit, leave it for a couple of days and come back and take that bag out. It should be really, really full of worms. Yep. Cool. Thank you. First, yep. first hand experience. I have never tried that method, but um, that's good to know. I've seen other people on Instagram use that method. Uh, if you've got a good amount of, of uh, vermicompost that you just can't bear dealing, thinking about do, doing it by hand, you can use a screen. Um, you can either make your own or purchase one. We'll be going through that in just a minute here. Uh, and another way to uh, separate the worm castings from the worms in this type of system um, I've made a four foot by eight foot worm bin that was a foot deep. And so I were, I was working the material so that it worked across the bin. And then ideally the worms were migrating with the newly added food. Uh, so you could work a box vertically and get the worms to migrate with the food as you're adding new food. Now, um, same thing with the mesh bag, all the worms aren't going to be migrating. Some like to hang back. And so you're always going to have to separate some, uh, but that's one way of doing it. So like if you have a, a bin, like a Rubbermaid bin style, you could, I know it's, it, once they get so deep, it's hard to work like half of the box horizontally and the other box horizontally, but that would be good. If you had a more shallow box, you could work one half of it. Uh, keep adding foods in little pockets. And then when you fill that side up, uh, start the entire other half. And then after so long, this stuff's going to get worked through and the worms will move over to the work new food. Um, and again, it's not always 100%. You're going to have a lot of worms that go over there and some worms that are just staying back and like the habitat that they've been in. Uh, so the light method that I was talking about, um, uh, Mary Applehoff goes into this into detail if you have that book, Worms Eat My Garbage, uh, or it's a good book. If you don't have it, I would purchase it. But you can dump your bin out and separate it into small piles like on newspapers on the floor or a drop cloth or something like that. And then you can you know, use lights, either this overhead light that you're dealing with or add a few more lights because you know, we already know that worms don't like lights, so they're going to move away from the lights. So as you make these little piles, they're going to move down to the bottom and you can kind of collect the top. And then you just kind of keep, keep collecting a little bit and setting it aside, collect a little bit, set it aside, and then they're going to continue to move down to away from the light and into the dark. So you just work a little bit at a time. Um, it's kind of a strenuous way of dealing with it, but a lot of people, it's kind of their Zen moment where they're working through their castings and separating out cocoons and stuff like that. Do you have anything to add? I take a, to I, yeah, I take a, I take a couple beers or more out to the barn when I'm uh, doing this. I really don't do it anymore, but it's, it is actually kind of fun because you know you can take this thing, you take a flat, uh, you can take like a scraper, like one of those drywall scrapers, and just sort of slightly scrape off the top of that stuff under that bright light until you see like worm meat and then what you want to do is get multiple of these multiple of these piles going at one time and then you'll do it to the next you know to the next pile until you see worm meat and by that by that time the the worms had worked their way down into that other pile and now you can scrape that one and eventually you're just sort of left with these two piles of worms because you moved up because they they are just going to be repelled from that light so it's uh it's 
it's kind of a, like you said, a Zen moment, sort of Zen way of doing it, but I, it's, it's enjoyable. I just need to make sure that I've got some other form of entertainment out there. And I'm not going to demonstrate that one today because I don't want to bore the hell out of you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, though, if you don't have Mary Applehoff's book, I would suggest checking that out and you can find out more about the light method there and plenty more other information. And if you've never done it, I may have mentioned this on the video before, but if you're a total worm nerd, I would go on YouTube and look up Mary Applehoff's video that she has. I can't remember exactly what it's called. It's super cheesy. It's from the 90s. It's maybe like 20 minutes long. All right. And then... Um, whether to use a screen or not to screen your materials. So vermicast or worm castings are good to use either way. If, you, if you're just top dressing you know, plants in your house or going out to the garden and side dressing your tomatoes or something like that in the summer or making compost tea, you really don't need to screen this material at all. There's no reason to screen out any of the larger chunks. Um, it's just gonna be slow release fertilizer in the future because the microbes are gonna slowly chew away at that and uh, cycle those nutrients to plants in your garden. If for some reason you're uh, growing vegetables and you use like seed trays or you're wanting to make a soil mix for some reason with your uh, worm castings, then you would want to screen it down to achieve a uniform size so that you're not having these chunks that are going to fill up your seed trays and cause some issues in any type of soil mix or something like that. So screening, uh, again, Steve's going to show you uh, this live in just a minute here, so you'll get to see one of these in action. Um, you can make one out of one by fours and make it a foot by foot, one foot by two feet, two feet by two feet, whatever size you feel, um, or match it to the size of your wheelbarrow or something like that. Um, most people go with a quarter inch and or a one eighth inch screen. So um, you can make a frame out of one by fours and then purchase hardware cloth. It's going to be the best construction for what you're wanting to use it for here. So um, they come in different sizes. Make sure that you're looking for the size of a quarter inch or eighth inch, whatever it is that you're wanting to use and cut those out using like a tin snips and staple it to the bottom of your frame. Uh, if you're making both, you would want to sift it through the quarter inch screen first to get the big chunks out and then you could sift the eighth inch screen next. Um, Mimi's Worms, uh, if you want to check out their website, it's mimisworms.com. Um, she's got a sifter like the one that Steve's about to show in just a minute here uh, that works really well. And uh, I believe that's made out of one by fours too. So uh, this yeah. is good so, for small amounts of, uh, just small amounts of worm castings. Yes, Steve. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, this is a product that we used to sell here. We may sell it again in the future. Uh, it's just how I can use my time and my space to do it. Uh, it worked really well. It's, it's, it was very popular, but we are not producing this right now. But Mimi's is. I will say hers is a bit bigger than the one mine was because it will fit in either a mortar tray or a wheelbarrow. Ours was not big enough to fit in a wheelbarrow. Um, but it's a bit expensive because of the shipping, but it is effective. These things are actually... If, if you if you pay for it and don't mind the cost of these things they are worth your time if you find harvesting to be super tedious and there's really about the only thing that's good for small scale otherwise there's a lot of other things that i'm actually going to show you that are overkill for most uh for most kind of home home gamers if you will so yeah that's all i got to say about that check out ch go to mimi's worms check out that sifter and uh and believe me it, it's going to work and the thing with that is you get a box with one eighth inch and a box with uh quarter inch. So depending on what you need, uh, you're going to have both options covered with, with that product. Cool. So, yep. Yeah. If you go to mimisworms.com, there's a uh, tool uh, tabs at the top of the screen there. And I believe it's under accessories. You click on accessories to check out the sifter. If you guys have any questions about those, just ask during the Q and A. And then um, there's different size trommels. Either you can purchase trommels or I mean, uh, purchase commercial trommels or build your own. Um, this picture I snagged off a worm group on Facebook. Um, so I think it, her name's Alicia, Aisha Hall. So if she's watching, thanks for the picture. Um, so if you've got large, medium to large amounts of worm castings that you need to process, 
putting it through a screen by hand is just going to be way too tedious. So you can make your own. I've seen several different ones that people will make out of like bicycle rims with hardware cloth attached. I'm not sure if this one here has bicycle rims. They have some type of a rim and then they've got, you can see hardware cloth attached and you'll see live the, the commercial trommel in a few minutes here. Um, so Mimi's also at mimisworms.com. She's got commercial units available. I believe right now she's only got the medium size. And these trommels are made. Oh, yes. Yeah, I think she's only got the one. She's. I think she's only got one in stock. And it's either the small or the medium. Okay, cool. Trommel. Yep. Uh, and these trommels are made to separate worms, get out your fine castings, and then also possibly get out coarser materials. So they would most of them have a one eighth and a one quarter inch screen, or some people will run only one size. Uh, the, the quarter inch is fine. Um, I think that's great to use for materials. Some people like something a bit finer and they'll only go with the eighth inch screen. So this one here, if you can see that picture well, it's someone who had constructed a crank and frame out of a PVC so that you can crank it around and get the trommel action going. And the then, one thing, Troy, to, to I'm yeah. sorry to add the to add rigidity. If you got a five, I think what a lot of people do with these is they take a five gallon bucket and they sort of cut off. They cut out the they cut out the end, and then they, and then they'll they'll take like three or four inches of the end and basically cut straight down through it, and then they'll attach the uh, like the wire cloth onto that that wire mesh. So yeah. you can use this on on both ends. That's kind of what people use to add the rigidity uh to the to the thing and then they kind of add a middle axle that that it's 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 a lot of <laughs> it's a lot of work and probably more expensive than what a lot of people think to just to make one of these things but it's, yeah. it's another one of those things once you have it and you've gone through that that hassle it's it's uh it's worth it yep and the commercial ones are expensive you're going to be saving quite a bit of money by making your own uh speaking of commercial ones so this is the one from I think this is the large one that Mimi used to offer, but this is a commercial unit. Uh, so on the left-hand side of your screen is where you would be putting the material in, and then it turns either direction, clockwise or counterclockwise. And then this one has a one-eighth inch screen, uh, sorry, two one-eighth inch screens at the top of the unit. And then as it flows down, it moves into a quarter inch screen. So you would put containers underneath here, and Steve's gonna show you that in just a minute. Uh, and then those collect the castings of vermicompost come out at the bottom. And then these are made to separate your worms out. So your worms, most of the worms make it all the way through and then uh, make it to that little ramp where they're then spit out into whatever kind of container. Um, sometimes the worms will get caught up in the screen and you got to go through and rescue some of the worms. But uh, for the most part, these work well for running large amounts of castings. These, I, I, I love my trommel uh the one thing that the these kind of trommels give you that other things don't is the kind of ability to separate the worm castings but the worms too so typically if you're only separating worm castings out of something like uh you know the brockwood worm shifter or a, like a sifter you're only these these have the ability what what happens here just to not to be too convoluted but that bell end that you see on the, on the that's sort of expanding outwards what happens is on the upward moving side of that, as it's as it's rotating, the worms stick to that stainless steel. They stick, but only so long, and they end up they end up coming out one side. They 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 really exit one side of that uh, uh, of that sort of bell end. So you can kind of put two containers down at the end. One's going to catch mostly worms, and the other one's going to catch mostly what we call overs, which are the which is a material that's too thick to get through the screen. So th these things are perfect. If you're thinking about doing this at scale, uh, trommel, if you can get your hands on it, is definitely the way to go. Yeah, and if you can see that little piece that's hanging down, it's an angled piece that's sitting right below the bell yeah. uh, opening at the right-hand side of the picture. That, that directs the worms one way and it directs the overs. It, ideally, it directs the worms one way and directs the overs another way. Some of them get mixed up a little bit, but like Steve was saying, yeah, they, it, it's, it's great because then you can just have one bin that you're grabbing all your worms out of and dumping it back into your large bin. So it works great for uh, large scale, medium to large scale worm composters. Cool.
Yeah, so now we're ready for Steve's demo. He's gonna show you the Urban Worm Bag first, and then the homemade hand sifter, and then the Brockwood shaking worm shifter, and then the trommel screener. And I'm cool. gonna turn, I'm gonna make it in the in here so that it's just Steve on the screen. There we go. Oh, oh God, that's terrible. <laughs> hey, everybody. Um, so I'm in my barn right now, just so I'm not baking out in the sun. I'm going to show you the urban worm bag, which I have outside. A couple things here is I don't tell people to put their urban worm bags or any worm bin if you can help it outside. You just want it to be protected. But just for the purpose of the demonstration today, it's outside. I'm going to show you just a really quick walkthrough of the urban worm bag. Um, we'll look inside as well and then um we'll just show you kind of how it opens at the bottom right now i've got the the removable bottom that the newest urban worm bags have i've got that fully removed and then we're just going to open up the drawstring and start pulling out material so you can see what it looks like um after that i'm going to set up on a tripod i'm going to show you three different things maybe i'll just carry the carry the camera around the hard part is i can't make my camera turn i can't see what i'm doing so i'm going to have to basically turn the camera off off screen to show you all these things. So sorry if it sorry if it's shaky, but it's the way we're going to have to do it today. Uh, but I'll show you the other the other equipment, like like Troy said, the, the hand sifter, the Brockwood worm sifter, uh, shifter, and then the uh, the trommel. And just so you know, the stuff we're going to be using today is going to be a drier material. Uh, with the exception of the stuff I pull out of the urban worm bag, which is worm castings and vermicompost, we're going to be uh, using uh, basically broken down wood chips. It's stuff that's starting to turn kind of into soil, but it's going to screen really well and give you an idea how these things work. So we'll go ahead and get started again. I'm going to apologize if things are a little bit shaky. Troy, if you need me to zoom in or zoom out or just uh, like, yeah, you I'll, know, I'll I'm totally, speak totally missing something. the mark, just yeah. let me know. So this is the urban worm bag. I've got it on a stand here that I sort of made, uh, just made really quickly out of uh, two by fours and one by, and it's on casters so I can roll it around. Um, I've got the support straps here, which kind of go into this, into these corners. And what you can, can do, what it really does is help. Yeah, sorry. What it, what it does is really just helps, help stiffen up that frame. So um, if you're wondering if you've got an urban worm bag and haven't seen these before, these cross straps are available. Um, so we'll go ahead and open up the bag and just look inside. I think that vermicompost should actually be boring in the top. It shouldn't be an orgy of worms that are just collecting around a, a, a you know, a, a watermelon because you're going to have problems later with moisture. Um, but if I dig down, actually, you know, I actually can can find some really rich areas of, of worms. In a vermicomposting environment, your worms are going to tend to be smaller than it, than when you purchase them. That is normal, I think. Um, you know, when you buy worms from a commercial grower, they're going to want to sell you the biggest, fattest worms as possible because, <laughs> um, A, it makes you happy, and, B, they actually can sell you fewer worms in that case. So um, not to be too cynical, uh, but worms in a, in a worm bin are going to be a little bit smaller. Um, I've neglected this bin a little bit, so some of the size uh, of the worms is probably my fault, but also just in a, in a worm bin, you're going to have smaller worms than when you, than when you started. So um, anyway, we'll just do a, an overview here. I've got this tray uh, down here to catch the castings. Um, I'm not sure if I can get a great angle at this. Again, Troy, just let me know if I'm doing anything uh, wrong where people can't see. But you Looking can see good. that I've got these I've got these buckles here in this Velcro. I've got that I've got that bottom fully removed right now, um, just for a couple reasons. I didn't want to have to worry about undoing it while we were on screen. It's super simple. You just undo the buckles, undo the Velcro, pull the thing off, and you're done. Um, so what this uh, has this is closed with a drawstring here that you can kind of see a little bit. I don't know if you can see that too well. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to just undo the drawstring. And I'm going to just pull the material out of the bottom. Now, I think I said before that I te I've, I've been a little bit, I've cheated a little bit with this. Um, and I've, I don't say cheated, but I've been been lazy. Sorry, I'm gonna, there we go. Um, but the material that comes out is really dark, really nice. It does have more worms in it because I'm really not that disciplined about it. I tend to do large feedings <laughs> and some of those large feedings uh, end up producing worms that come out of the, uh, come out of the bottom. But you can see the material that I get is, is you know, 
super dark. I mean, I'm putting paper in here that's white and it turns out like, like this. <laughs> so it is, uh, it's really good stuff. Um, so that is, that kind of does the harvest there. You don't have to worry about all of the material coming out of the bottom of the bag because like I said earlier, I've got this bag basically full. Um, so when you got a nice full bag, you don't have to worry about all of the material just dumping, just dumping out of the bottom. Uh, let's see, did I miss anything, Troy? Um, um, that's that's really that it. it. Okay. One other thing that's good about keeping that bottom fully removed, if you if you're not keeping this in this thing inside, is that you get better airflow to the bottom, which helps dry it out. So you end up getting a better harvest. So um, anyway, here I am. I'm going to set this thing up. I'm I, actually. I tell you what, I may just do a do a. a I may not worry about like setting it up on the tripod, but I've got the trommel here, the Brockwood worm sh uh, shifter here, and the uh, the hand screener right here. So I'm just I'm just gonna carry the phone around. I'm not gonna set it up on the tripod, but I'm just gonna come over here to this to this uh, this sifter, which is basically a, a frame that sits in a in a mortar tray, and then there's a there's a box here which has got if you can see the I don't know if you can see the underside of it, but it's a, it's a mesh and there's casters that sit on this rail and we're just going to run this thing back and forth. Can you tilt, would help tilt down a little bit? Actually, yep. Yep. It actually helps if there's a little less material in there. But the stuff that comes out of the bottom is really a very fine very fine material can you see that okay yeah we can see it just so okay. you're aware your um vid, uh, audio i'm sorry your audio is good but your visual is a little choppy okay all right that's so you may uh, want to hold some my... things a, a few seconds longer than normal there but it's okay. looking good okay okay cool so that's the hand that's the hand sifter I'm going to show you that this is the Brockwood uh, worm sifter. I believe I've got it. Uh, no, I don't have it. I'm going to have to do a little bit of shaky video work here. Um, I'm going to plug this, uh, plug this bad boy in. Sorry about the video. Um, so this, uh, I've got it. I've got it tilted. Maybe just so you could have seen it better on the. Uh, uh, if, I, if it were on the tripod, but I've kind of loaded this up with some of that material I was talking about before. I put a couple of catches down here. What's going to happen is the material that's going to be screened. What you're going to you're going to put this stuff on the screen. This thing's Can just going to shake. A little and bit. It's gonna, yeah, and go. it's going to shake at a it's going to shake at a slight incline, and then it's going to work its way down to this this exit point that you see right there, and that's where the overs go. So I'm going to turn this on. It's going to make some noise. It's going to start shaking. And uh, so you can see the stuff that comes out at the end is really very, uh, very coarse material. And then the stuff that we're going to get out of the bottom is much finer material. So I'm going to stop it right now. I'm going to stop it right now. I'm going to pull this other guy out. And can you see that well? Yeah, lower down just okay. a little bit. There okay. you go. So anyway, the, the stuff that comes out looks a lot better. I will tell you that you really need your stuff to be dry for this thing to be effective. Uh, just like with any screening, you need it, you need it to be dry. Um, otherwise, you're going to get a lot of what's called snowballing as that stuff sort of aggregates onto itself. And you end up getting a lot of otherwise viable worm castings that are just balled up in your overs. So you don't want that um so we'll just show you the next thing the big daddy this is a trommel i think it's about 18 feet long um let's see can we yeah so you can see that there uh this is mostly one eighth screens so actually if we if we go up here there's one two three four one eighth inch screens followed by a quarter inch screen at the very end this thing is going to rotate. I love these things that rotate because there's just constant, uh, there's just constant sifting going on and it prolongs the amount of time 
that the material is in contact with a screen, unlike something like this, where it's only gonna be for a couple feet, this one's gonna be for a long time. So these things are very, very efficient. So I'm gonna turn this on. It's also gonna create some noise. I'll try to speak over the noise a little bit and talk about what's going on. So, whoops, I gotta plug it in. Sorry, sorry for the crappy uh, production value here, everybody, but you know, hey, it's live TV, right? So yeah, with this unit, you'd want to put like bins or either dish, uh, I mean, uh, busing bins like he's using there, the black ones or some other type of bin underneath there and catch all of your uh, castings and vermicompost out the bottom. And then your worms are going to come out the other end. Yep. Yep. So I'll just go ahead and start it here. These things are, these things should only rotate at about 12 RPMs, um, maybe 15. Uh, so it should be a very sort of slow and deliberate process. So you can see this stuff just sort of spilling. And the nice thing is you don't get that much um, snowballing with this because it's sort of constantly being broken apart by that, by that, uh, you know, by that, that kind of where it lifts and then falls. So and stuff actually starts getting more dried out as it works its way down the trommel. So we'll just do a quick, uh, quick overview. I didn't set the bins all the way down the edge, but you can see this material that comes out is really nice, really fine. Uh, again, this is just this is just this this wood chip material that I'm screening. Um, it's not actual vermicompost. So this is the end. I think you can see it okay. Yep. And I'm gonna. Um, so this. The, the the upward the upward moving edge right here um, is the is the edge where the worms are going to stick to on the way out, and all the other coarser material like you see here is just going to sort of is just going to sort of dump into a into a catch or right onto the concrete like I've got. So um, anyway, that's that's the trommel. This is the thing that we use. We are not actively vermicomposting here right now, which sort of sort of sucks but at the same time <laughs> we've kept uh we've kept the equipment so we can demonstrate to you guys as well so um anyway we uh if, if you are interested in doing this at any sort of scale beyond the hobby level i think a trommel is definitely worth your time if you're not i would probably only just do these uh this hand sifter and i wanted to talk about the coconut core here real fast too this is a brick of our coconut core and when we were talking about like using dry coconut core, if you just sort of take a, a grater or just cut off a little bit of this stuff, it, it, it starts getting really like flaky and it acts like it, it acts like um, kitty litter to help sop up excess moisture. So you end up you end up being able to dry out your vermicompost to be screened much more easily than if you're trying to just screen wet vermicompost. So um, anyway, I'm going to turn this thing off, stop making noise. I'll go back up in the shade, <laughs> crack open a beer, I don't know. Uh, and we can uh, take some uh, some questions from, from everybody. So, um, Troy, I don't know if you had anything after that, but I'm gonna go, uh, I'm gonna turn off my camera, wipe myself down and I'll see you in a second. Yeah, cool. I think that should be about it. Um, I hadn't really seen any questions pop up here on the side. If anybody wants to comment and type any questions, uh, I'm going to look through real quick to see, somebody said, any suggestions on economic screening methods to separate cocoon eggs from castings? Um, I can't think of any economic ones on a large scale. Uh, there's a guy who was using um, the little letter trays that you buy at like Office Depot or whatever, like that you put your letter, like outgoing mail into. They're like the perfect size. They're an eighth inch or a little bit less. Um, and he was using those to put material in and sh sift it just like kind of that thing that Steve just had to separate cocoons out from material. But um, usually your cocoons are gonna come out in the quarter inch screen and you just kind of have to either use that material. I'll, so I'll use, I'll have one bin that I'll know, see has a bunch of cocoons in there and I'll usually just separate that in to set, set it off as like a breeder bin and treat that as a breeder bin to, cause I've got a bunch of cocoons in there. But as far as separating them out, Steve, have you read or uh, heard of anyone who 
knows of a way of getting separating cocoons from castings? The only way that I've seen to do it is actually to take your vermicompost, and I would probably just find a, a sort of a cocoon rich area if you've got it. And the one thing I've done, which kind of works, it's just sort of weird to still, it's sort of weird is to flood, is to flood your vermicompost, is to put it into a mortar tray, fill it with water and your vermicompost is gonna settle, but your cocoons are gonna float. So that is one weird way. You, the thing is, is now you've created, now you kind of flooded everything else. So you, if, if all you wanna do is get cocoons out, then that may be a way to, to do it. So you can kind of scrape the, the cocoons off the top or slide a, a screen underneath the, uh, you know, underneath the cocoons and get them out of there. But your worms and your, you know, your vermicompost are gonna be flooded. So you'll need to rehab that somewhat. Cool, thanks, thanks. Yep. Uh, I'm just going through and see if there's any other questions. I didn't notice any other ones. Um, I'm not seeing any other. I, it looks I like you a, start, a couple th start a couple things. I'm not seeing yeah yeah we can we can go through the starred ones I'll, I'll i'll do one of the most recent ones um actually i'll just get start from the most recent first molly asks what 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 do cocoons look like cocoons look like um cocoons look like sort of lemon shaped sort of semi-translucent kind of semi-clear uh, uh little things that are probably about the size of a pinhead they're going to have kind of a tapered end and the more mature ones are going to be darker and the newer ones are going to be are going to be lighter so as they are going to change in color as the worms sort of grow in there and each of those each of those cocoons is going to have about three three uh three worms uh in it so that's that's what the cocoons look like um they're usually yellow golden or orange or orangish brown in color yep yep um michael asks if last year's leaves and yard mulch are good for the worms i say absolutely yeah the leaf mold is one of the best materials for worms to work through because it's already started breaking down like if you put like really woody material in there it's going to be good for your fungi but it's not going to break down it's not going to break down quickly it's not going to turn into worm castings quickly so last year's leaves and yard mulch is, is uh is excellent um i think mary asked a question here um Somebody was asking about the the the, uh, the uh, screen size for getting cocoons out. You would want one eighth inch, one eighth inch screen, especially with the pandemic and all the supply chain stuff, is sort of difficult to find. Um, but one eighth inch uh, screen uh, is going to be is going to be the way to go uh, for that. Um, and Kirsten asked about the urban worm bag harvest. If you just take any worms that you that come out the bottom back into the top of the bag, absolutely. Anything, sometimes if there's just too many worms that I get out of the bottom, I'll just put everything back in the top and I'm not even gonna worry about screening it. Um, or if you've got so, excess worms, you could always start a new bin too. Right, right, right. So um, anyway, yeah, I think I think you may have worked through that right now. Let's see if I got all the ones that I starred. Um, so uh, somebody asked, how long does it take to create vermicompost? So it's usually going to take three to four months at least when you're from the time that you start worms with bedding and food until you're ready to have uh, worm castings to harvest. It depends on the size so of the bin too. If you've got a smaller bin, it might be a couple months. Yeah, and and the the one thing I think I think eight weeks is about as little as I would tell people that you've actually can got really get worm castings out of something. But the one thing I would tell you to do is start with existing vermicompost if you can, not just because you're cheating. I mean, it's sort of like you're getting closer to the end with what you're starting with, right? But the other thing it's going to do is colonize everything else in the bin with those with those bacteria that are going to start start breaking things down. So you're actually sort of turbo boosting your worm bin start with uh, with that microbe rich material. So that's that's probably the biggest cheat code I could tell somebody to to end up speeding up that that process. So it's not like four months, six months like it is if you just start from a from a cold stop. Uh, yeah, you can think about it. If you brew kombucha or have ever made vinegar, you need somewhat of a mother culture to add to that so that you're getting a boost of the microbiology that you need to start, you know, kombucha or whatever. So it's the same thing. You're inoculating your material with that vermicompost from your last time. And I would also suggest to go grab uh, soil from like a local forest, or if you can go out your backyard to a wild area 
and grab a handful of soil from there and stick it in your bin too, because that you're inoculating mm -hmm. the bin with uh, native microorganisms. Right. Um, Industrial tumbleweed on YouTube is asking how many worms are ex how many worms are excess worms in an urban worm bag. I, I think I'm I think I think what he's asking is how many is too many. Um, really, you 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 can't have too many worms in a worm bin for the for the reason that being that worms are good self regulators and will stop reproduction uh, in a worm bin if 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 the conditions aren't right for them to continue reproducing. So. And that, that means that could be population, that could be that it's gotten too dry, that it's gotten too hot or too cold, or that there's not enough food, uh, that y y there's a whole lot of reasons why worms will stop their own reproduction, but they will stop their own reproduction. So it's not like they're just going to keep reproducing and you're just going to have worms that are just coming out, coming out of your worm bin. Uh, so uh, the, the urban worm bag should hold, in theory, between six to eight pounds of worms at, at its maximum. Um, just because we're limited by surface area. So vermicomposting is surface area dependent and you've really only got about four, four square feet of vermicomposting area in our urban worm bag. And if you go two to three pounds per square foot in a continuous flow bin, which I think is even ambitious, you should be able to get kind of that, uh, you know, let's just say two pounds, let's just say one and a half to two pounds is gonna give you that six to eight pounds of, uh, of worms. So sorry for the long answer there. Um, but uh, let's see what happens. Jeff on YouTube asks, what happens if you forget or just don't harvest your vermicompost from a plastic bin, assuming you continue to feed regularly and are not adding new bedding. Uh, so that's, that's the thing is like with, with the batch method, if you're just starting a bin in a bucket or uh, in, a, in a Rubbermaid bin, you're, you're never, you really, it's hard to get to the point where you're ready to harvest because your bin is never like done because you need to kind of empty most everything out of there unless you're doing one of these horizontal migration methods or something like that jeff um so i would just stop i would just stop adding food and and bedding material uh, probably i'd I'd, get, I'd even go a month before you're ready to harvest at least a couple weeks or a month your worms are not going to starve believe me they will eat their own poop they'll happily eat their own poop it's organic matter so um yeah uh anyway i again long long answer to a short short question it's 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 okay to continue to feed that bin and then just get to the castings when you can what you don't want to have happen is have it become so compacted and anaerobic over time that the the, the castings you get out of there need to be rehabbed before you use them so um our might is detriment oh, oh sorry. Go, ahead, go, ahead. go ahead that's a quick one i'll, I'll answer yeah. this after that yeah um Captain Blackheart, love that name. Are mites detrimental to your indoor grow? I presume he's talking about cannabis. I can't answer that one, um, but mites are gonna be okay in a worm bin. They're just another form of a decomposer, uh, but you may not want them uh, munching away on anything in your in your cannabis grow. So usually I, the I mites, that, I was just gonna say, usually the mites that are in, that are breaking down material are not gonna be the same species of mites that are gonna be an issue on live plants. Okay. There's uh, some. There are some insects and uh, arthropods that may uh, eat both live and dead tissue, but normally it's one or the other. They'll prefer a live tissue, or they'll be decomposers that break down dead tissue. Uh, cool. Kirsten had asked, "Once you harvest vermicompost, how long does it stay good or viable? Um, will it stay good until the spring if she takes it in the fall?" So um, it's best to keep any type of compost or vermicompost a bit moist and in, in a place where it can breathe. You wanna make sure that this stuff gets air because we're working with aerobic microorganisms. So you wouldn't wanna close anything off and keep it sealed up. Um, and if you let stuff dry out too much, you're gonna have, most things are gonna go dormant. If you've got good fungi in there, um, if you let it dry out too much, it could have uh, harmful effects on some of the microbes, but most of it's going to go dormant and then we'll come back once you wet it. But it's good to keep the, could to keep that material a bit moist anyway. This, this so, was really interesting. I'm, gl I'm glad these guys did this, but uh, our bulk warm casting suppliers, Lush uh, uh, Farms there, they, uh, they tested their castings 
when the, when they first harvested them, and then they also um, tested them six months later. But they had kept them protected from UV light. They kept them moist. They basically kept them kept them in in what conditions the kind of conditions a human being would like, honestly. Um, and and so they they tested them and compared the tests, and they were it was in it they were unchanged actually it was really tough to tell the two samples apart from the tests and 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 it was six month old casting so if you're keeping your castings protected from uv light and moist enough you should be you should keep them for you should be able to keep them for a long time so i'd have no problem with you harvesting in the fall and then just keeping those castings around till till the spring i just keep them indoors somewhere uh because what's ha what happens too i don't know where you live but but if if they're somewhere where it's gonna you're gonna get a hard freeze and you're outside that water is actually going to get released from those castings. It's going to make them drier if they end up freezing over the summer. So, but otherwise you should be fine harvesting them and then just keeping them for the, uh, keeping them for the spring. So. Yeah. Same. I've had conversations with different people who are commercial vermicompost, uh, to sell commercial vermicompost and have tested out different bags and the stuff will last at least the biology will be good and remain the same for at least nine months. So, but I would say, yeah, it'll last even longer. I, I keep my compost for, I'll use it for up to two years. That's, usually stuff just keeps getting better and better because of the microbes and it'll just become smaller in size. Mm -hmm. Well, I tell you what, that we're getting some good questions here, but I think we should start wrapping it up. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, um, uh, get to Mary, well, two Marys here, and then we'll, we'll call it a day. But Mary Howell asks on, on YouTube, does it matter if red wigglers get into our garden soil? Do they coexist with normal earthworms? They'll coexist just fine. I mean, they're going to get along. They're not going to fight or anything like that. It's just that uh, regular, reg, uh, like composting worms are not real, really soil dwellers. So you're not going to, they're not going to burrow and be able to protect themselves and do what they need to do. They need a really loose material uh to to live in so your red wigglers in your garden are not going to probably survive uh conversely if you take regular earthworms that you would that you would find in your garden and put them into a worm bin you're they're not going to be composting worms and they're, they're not going to want to live in the same sort of densities that composting worms do so the two are going to be fine together it's just that they're not going to thrive in in each other's environment so don't put composting worms in a garden and don't put garden worms in a, in a compost bin um this is and something so, I was hoping to do in a future Wednesday episode, actually. Okay. Yeah, I we should get good. to that because, yeah, right. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't mean to keep interrupting. That, that, that would be an excellent thing to go over because it's a very common, very common question. Yeah. Um, Mary, so Mary T, and I think we'll, we'll wrap it up after this, but Mary T asks, what inputs are the riskiest for persistent herbicides? Should, should cornmeal or oatmeal be certified organic? I don't really think anything i i'm not a purist when it comes to this stuff i don't think anything that you put in your bin needs to be certified organic uh i think these are two different questions actually so you know corn moy cornmeal or oatmeal i put conventional stuff in there as far as i'm concerned i i would not not vermicompost because it's not organic the riskiest inputs for persist persistent herbicide um is probably going to be horse manure and horse manure is often uh, the fresher. Well, it doesn't matter if it's fresh because this stuff will last in the in the soil for years. And Troy, I know you know a lot about this stuff. But persistent herbicides are often used to spray uh, to take care of thistle uh, in hay. So horses will not eat hay that has thistle in it. So it's important for people that own horses to not have thistle in their hay. So hay hay growers do not are, are, are going to spray for that stuff. And some of the things they're going to spray are, are these persistent herbicides. There's amino cyclor amino. and then there's pi, pi, pychlorum amino. Yeah. Say it again. Uh, you just threw me off. <laughs> no, I'm amino not. Even, look, amino pyrrolid is the most common one lately and it's the longest lasting. Okay. So uh, yeah, these things and they, 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 it just takes a couple parts per, per million or billion before they actually start harming things like tomato plants and really broad, really kind of broadleaf plants. So the, the, the horse manure is the, is the biggest, uh, is the riskiest input there. So, Hey guys, we just uh, crossed the hour mark. Um, I thought this was a really good one. Uh, thanks for, if you stuck with it through the whole time and my shaky video, we'll try to have something a little more sophisticated set up next time. Um, but I thought this, I thought this went really well. 
Troy, are you around next week to do another one of these? Uh, yes, I should be next week. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry to make you commit on live, uh, <laughs> on live YouTube. Um, if, if you're not no big deal, but we're going to try to, we're trying to do these every Wednesday at 11. So, um, Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed this. Let us know in the comments, even if you're watching this afterwards, if you if you got any questions. Um, if you uh, want to get a discount on anything, I don't say on anything, but almost all of our products uh, today, you can use Harvest 10 uh, at checkout. Um, and uh, that way we know that uh, you, that's your, your little reward for, uh, for joining us today. And we'd appreciate that support. So uh, I think we should sign off here. Uh, we will send an email out. If you're not on the email list, what I would do is go to urbanormcompany.com, wait for the annoying pop-up to pop up and put your email address in. And that way you'll be notified every time that we, uh, that we do one of these lives. The other thing that you can do, if you're on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. And then there's a little, little bell after you subscribe, there's a little bell that, that, uh, that you can click that gives you an alert when we, when we, uh, go live as well. So, um, cool. I think we should call it a day. I'm hungry. I need lunch and I need to clean up the mess I made in the backyard. Cool. Thank so, you. I was just typing it out here. I was going to hope to do, uh, also with persistent herbicides, do a future Wednesday episode to cover that more deeply. So, um, that should be nice. covered in another Wednesday episode, but thanks for tuning in everybody. I uh, appreciate you being here and we'll see you next week. All right. Bye-bye.